Story recapped here. Today, I'm going to explain an action, adventure, and sci-fi film called The Core. Spoilers ahead. Watch out and take care. It's Green World Day in Boston, Massachusetts, and a businessman's watch stops working. He and two of his workmates enter a room for a meeting. Suddenly, he faints flat on the table. At the same time, commotion can be heard from outside, cars are crashing, and everything and everyone is in chaos. At a university, Dr. Josh Keyes lectures students about sound waves. He looks disappointed as his students don't seem interested in the lesson. So he starts blowing on a trumpet into a block of limestone. However, his performance gets interrupted by government agents. He asks what's going on, but the agents refuse to answer. They enter a shady looking area, and there Josh meets an old friend, Serge. They travel through the tunnels, catching up on each other's lives. They enter a place full of dead bodies and meets General Thomas, who reminds them of the sensitivity of what they're about to discuss. He then starts talking about how all those bodies died at the same time. They brainstorm about what could have caused this, and Josh blurts out that they all had pacemakers. Thomas commends his quick tinking and asks if a weapon did this. They both agree that no weapon like that can be made with present technology. The general is happy with the conclusion and leaves. But the two remain dissatisfied. News about aggressive birds spread worldwide, reaching Josh and his workmates. The look on his face changes as he realizes something. He asks his friends to search up any weird news happening worldwide that concerns the Earth's magnetic field. In space, Major Rebecca Childs, nicknamed Beck, pilots a space shuttle. Commander Richard Iverson floats his way into the seat next to her. They prepare for re-entry and joke about how Richard will not let Beck assume control of the ship. As they get near the atmosphere, they suddenly lose connection, leaving Houston worried. An alarm starts blaring, and Richard notices that they're out of position. The pressure rises when they see Los Angeles in the distance. Beck makes some quick calculations and suggests they adjust their course. Houston approves the decision, and they descend into the LA River, barely avoiding multiple bridges and stopping precisely before an unaware construction worker. Dr. Konrad Zimski makes his way down the steps of the Academy of Sciences to be met by the paparazzi and an anxious Joshua he gives him a document, and Conrad mistakenly signs it, thinking that Josh is asking for his autograph. Conrad condescendingly agrees to look at the paper, Josh explains that the report is proof of Earth's impending destruction. At his office, Conrad says that Josh's discovery is undoubtedly wrong as he wouldn't have missed this significant threat. As Josh leaves, he predicts that more devastating effects will occur in the following days to prove his conclusion further. Feeling disturbed, Conrad opens his safe and pulls out files that are labeled secret. Beck stands anxiously and encounters General Thomas. She asks about the situation concerning the space shuttle crash. Thomas honestly says that things aren't looking that great. The conversation gets interrupted by Conrad calling him to report about Josh's discovery. Serge and Josh drink at a bar, continuing their reunion. The two agents from before disrupt their evening and ask Josh to report to the Pentagon. A panel of high-ranking individuals interrogates Joshua Conrad sits among the group, taking credit for Josh's research, but he doesn't care as it's the end of the world anyway. Without any sugarcoating, Josh announces that in a year, everyone will be dead. Using a peach, Josh discusses how the core of the Earth has stopped spinning. Due to this, the electromagnetic field has also stopped working, leading to the inevitable burning of the planet. With all that information, the panel asks Josh and Conrad to think of ways to fix this. Josh enumerates all the reasons why fixing doing that is impossible. Conrad, being the unlikely optimist in the room, interrupts and asks what if they get rid of all the impossibilities. The group flies off to meet with Dr. Ed Brazelton or Braz. Braz demonstrates how his invention works. The contraption fires up a laser that burns a hole through a dense rock formation. Braz then shows how the laser can't pass through concrete with a mouse test subject. Little by little, they try to believe that restarting the core can be done. Thomas offers all the resources Braz can dream of to construct a ship that can journey into the core. FBI personnel knocks on the door of a man named Theodore Finch. A frantic Finch starts to purge his computers to eliminate any trace of being a hacker. They arrest him and bring him to meet with Thomas and the group. Conrad voices out his doubts with this so-called best hacker in the world. This prompts Finch to list out all the things he can steal and do to Conrad, asserting his intellectual dominance. He makes some modifications to Josh's phone with just a wrapper of gum. All while accepting the task of hacking the planet. Beck and her team are in a meeting discussing their actions during the botched landing. While she's being interrogated, General Thomas walks in. The panel commands her navigation skills and then assigns her and Commander Richard to a new mission. The core mission. In a military base, Josh gets ready to announce the news of the world ending to a select group of people. Thomas introduces Beck and Richard to the rest of the crew. The nerves are getting to Josh as he struggles with his necktie. Beck offers assistance, and they make some small talk. Josh starts his speech with a joke, and the crowd's silence makes him feel like the world should have ended at that moment. He starts to relay the preparations they'll make for the next three months. They plan to journey into the core and drop weapons of mass destruction to repair the electromagnetic field. Finch creates a program called VirusBot that aims to delete any information about the mission that may leak. Throughout the months, the ship gets closer and closer to being operational. The crew gains cohesiveness after countless simulation failures. 
above all, a budding relationship between Beck and Josh cultivates. While Beck practices alone in the cockpit simulator, Richard gives her a piece of his wisdom. He explains what it takes to become a leader, to which Beck replies by asking if he doesn't think she's fit to be one. Richard clears things up by telling her that she's too good, to the point that she's not capable of making bad decisions, further saying that a leader is made not by the victories but by the defeats. Lightning superstorms start to appear throughout the planet, creating chaos and destruction. The planet's fast decay shortens the deadline of the mission. In the South Pacific, the team gets ready to ride aboard the ship that Bra's named Virgil. The crew makes a toast, hoping for their success. The wine's bitterness starts their sweet goodbye to the surface and the possibilities of sour encounters ahead. In the cockpit, they begin their preparations to descend in the depths of Mariana's trench. Meanwhile, Conrad is preoccupied with his voice memos that will document the entire journey. Mission Control gives them the go-ahead, and Virgil dives into the ocean. A group of whales accompanies them, and their vocalizations seem as though they wish the crew good luck. It's off to an unlucky start as an underwater earthquake occurs. Rocks collide with the ship, but Virgil's integrity is unmatched. Finally, the lasers fire and they breach through the Earth's crust. Mission Control detects their activity, and they celebrate the small victory. Virgil's condition is excellent, and the crew readies themselves as they transition into the mantle. Instantaneously, Conrad narrates the experience, showing off his poetic ability. Twelve hours later, the crew frantically puts on their seatbelts as they're about to approach empty space. A variable that they didn't account for during their preparations. They experience heavy turbulence as they crash into pillars made from purple crystals. Virgil is stuck as something has jammed up the lasers. With no other choice, the crew prepares for extravehicular activity. Beck lights up the vicinity, and the glimmering crystal formation mesmerizes the group. Braz begins to cut the piece stuck to the lasers, then suddenly, lava starts dropping from above. A cowardly Conrad runs back inside while Braz and Josh continue the cutting. Josh's vital signs are dropping due to removing his oxygen tube used to power Braz's tools. He faints, and Serge rushes out to carry him back into the ship. Meanwhile, the piece hampering the laser is finally removed. Beck fires up the laser, prompting Richard to celebrate. The celebration gets cut off short by a shard of debris that punctures Richard's suit. He dies and falls into the lava. Beck is hurt, causing her to have a mental lapse. She finally snaps out of it and moves to Richard's seat, signifying the passing of the torch. Virgil submerges into the lava, and they continue their journey, barely escaping the collapsing cavern. Josh wakes up and is met with the sad news of Richard's passing. They mourn his death and gathers the strength to carry on. Beck and Josh get to know more about one another. She says she admires him for what he did, but Josh laughs it off, saying the lack of oxygen allowed him not to cry. The second day of the mission begins, and they travel deeper into the mantle. Josh, Braz, and Serge check in on the nukes, getting them ready for deployment. Beck alerts the crew of the bumpy road ahead as giant blocks of diamonds obstruct their way. The weapons unit where the three are staying gets damaged, causing the ejection system to start. They make their way out, but Serge turns back. He grabs the timers in his notebook, handing it to Joshua Serge saves the mission but not himself. As a last attempt to save Serge, Josh asks Beck to override the ejection system. However, Conrad reminds her that a damaged compartment threatens the entire ship. There Beck realizes what Richard said to her. She makes a difficult decision not to override, ignoring the cries of Joshua. Josh talks to a frightened Serge on the monitor while Braz tries to open up the doors manually. Feeling hopeless, Braz cries because he doesn't know what to do. Serge gets crushed, and the unit ejects into the mantle. An air of melancholy fills the ship as they lose another member. Josh confronts Beck and asks her why she let Serge die. He makes her feel worse about her decision by showing Serge's notebook. Josh continues to berate Beck, but Beck points out that this had to be done to save the world, to save Serge's family. Virgil is about to enter the core interface. The crew prepares for breach, and Josh regains his calm manner. The ships move at dangerous speeds as the density of the core is lighter than what they predicted. Beck seems optimistic as she says that this means they'll reach the outer core sooner. However, Conrad asks Braz to run the detonation simulation. With the unexpected density change, they'll fail to restart the core. Conrad suggests that they return to the surface and accept that the world is going to end. Regardless of the crew disagreeing, he informs Mission Control that they'll have to resort to the alternative plan, Project Destiny. Conrad discusses to the uninformed members about this device that can produce seismic activity. Braz asks how this can restart the core. Josh butts in and says that it's the one responsible for the core's stoppage in the first place. Conrad announces that this is their best and only hope in restarting the core. Josh argues that Project Destiny will not fix the core, instead, it will make it worse. Thomas interrupts the heated discussion, he says that he has a direct order from the president to turn the ship back and continue with the alternate plan. An optimistic Josh suggests continuing with the initial plan. If they don't restart the core, only then will Project Destiny be initiated. Conrad's selfishness persists, and he snaps at him, saying that the shock will kill them. Beck has the final say, and she, along with Braz and Josh, decides to still give it a shot. Conrad lets his emotions get to him, and Braz knocks him out for some peace and quiet. Finch reports to mission control of a recent electromagnetic tear. Invisible microwaves from space puncture a hole in the field, heating the Golden Gate Bridge. Cables break, and everything in the area melts due to the extreme heat. 
time is running out, and General Thomas announces that they will fire up Destiny before the next tier occurs. Finch and Josh communicate through secretive means. Finch is tasked to delay the commencing of Project Destiny, and he quickly finds the secret location. Back at Virgil, Josh and Braz run simulations to figure out how they can restart the core. Conrad laughs and mocks them. Suddenly, he realizes something. While smoking a cigarette, Conrad explains to the two the theory he came up with. They plan to separate in time the detonations causing a ripple effect to occur, reinforcing each explosion with one another. The simulation they run is a success, but the application is nowhere near as easy. Project Destiny begins their operations with approval from Thomas. Meanwhile, Finch has his hands full hacking them. His eyes get watery as he gets denied every time he tries to take control of the system. Virgil nears the inner core. They plan to eject the compartments, with each having its nuclear warhead. However, Braz explains that the ship isn't designed to discharge intact segments. They will have to modify the master gear, but it's located in a crawl space that's temperature reaches 9000 degrees. Essentially, the person that will enter that area has no chance to survive. The three huddle to pick sticks that will determine whether they get to survive or not. Braz gets the short end of the stick, and he accepts his fate. 20 years of his life have been dedicated to Virgil. He has no intention of letting it fail, even if it means he'd meet his demise. Braz says his goodbyes to the rest of the crew. Before he descends, he and Conrad share a sentimental moment. Braz makes his way to the tunnels, and with every step, he is met with extreme heat. However, his burning passion remains inextinguishable as he completes his mission, dying in the process. After a while, Josh and Conrad move the warheads to their respective compartments, commencing the ejection procedure. Back on the surface, Thomas initiates the firing sequence of Project Destiny. As the countdown begins, Finch finally gets access, shutting off its operations. Two more compartments get ejected, and at the fourth compartment, Josh and Conrad realize that there have been some miscalculations. As they frantically try to fix the situation, the turbulence causes the bomb to trap Joshua Beck as oblivious of the problem, and the two struggle to lift the bomb. Conrad apologizes, and just as he's about to leave, Beck changes direction, making the bomb roll into Conrad's leg. He shouts at Josh to leave him behind. With his last words, Conrad tells Josh to use the fuel rods to create a larger explosion. Josh tries to ask Beck for her opinion about taking the fuel rods, but communications are still down. This leaves him with no choice but to do as Conrad said. Virgil turns off, and Josh desperately tries to carry the burning fuel rods to the last compartment. The compartment ejects, and an injured and exhausted Josh sits with a worried Beck. The two comfort one another as they await their final moments. A spark of hope appears in Josh's eyes as he says to Beck that they can use the heat from the core to start the ship back up. A still alive Conrad speaks into his voice recorder. He laughs hysterically as the bomb in his compartment goes off. Meanwhile, Mission Control celebrates as the core starts to spin once again. They get to survive another day, however, not the same can be said for Josh and Beck as they continue to modify the ship. Virgil turns on, and the overjoyed couple kisses. They speed through the layers of the Earth, barely escaping the explosion. The radar detects Virgil nearing the crust somewhere in Hawaii. They make it through, but Mission Control lost contact with them. With no heat, the ship loses its power. They lie at the bottom of the ocean, hoping to be rescued, a fleet of vessels ventures into the seas of Hawaii. General Thomas doubts that the two are still alive, Finch pleads to keep looking. The sonar detects no signs of Virgil, only the whale's vocalizations. Just as they're about to give up, Finch realizes something about the whales. The whales are circling the ship, and they successfully rescue Josh and Beck. A week later, Finch sits at an internet cafe. With his trusted computer and hot pocket, he shares the heroics of the fallen members of the crew to the entire world.